Well, we will continue uh, in our series, The Way Back, moving into week three today. And I'm excited for what we have covered to this point because, again, we're on a journey together. And as uh, Rob mentioned already, our hiker, I, I hear I called him a hitchhiker last week, which I suppose could be true. Maybe he is a, he's a hitchhiker and a hiker. Uh, right now, he's hiking and not hitchhiking. So he's hiking his way up this mountain, kind of symbolizing this journey that we are on together. And so in week one, we began here kind of down at base camp by asking this question, who is God? Who is God? And that is a question that it really is at the foundation of everything in life. Everybody on some level or another, I do believe, contemplates this question. Even those who don't believe in God have an answer to the question, who is God? And for those of us who do believe in God, or even for you if you're just searching this morning, let me tell you that this is probably the most important question you will ever ask in life. Who is God? And so in week one, we started by looking at Genesis 1, the account of creation where God reveals himself to us as the one who created everything. So I want you just to think about that for a minute. If you're here this morning, and for all those who aren't here this morning, everybody you see, everybody you'll come in contact with through this week has been created by God. And that's an incredibly powerful thought when we personalize that idea. I am God's creation. And then week two as our hikers started working up this kind of this brown section of our mountain together, we asked this question that is kind of a follow-up to the first question. If we believe that God is, again, for starters, the one who created everything, then I think we need to ask this question, what does creation teach us about the one who created everything? What does creation teach us about the Creator? And last week, we looked at that in kind of from, from two different perspectives or two different angles. First, we looked at it from the angle of beauty. We learn a lot about God, the creator, when we look around and we see that so many things in nature are just absolutely stunning in beauty. But then as well, we looked at it from this angle that God has created everything. When we think about size from, from the vastness of the universe all the way down to things that we can never see with our eye, things that we can kind of theorize about, all the way down to the smallest subatomic particles. God has created it. So last week, the challenge was to find some time to retreat to a place that allows you to contemplate the majesty of the Creator, or maybe if you don't have time to do that, to, to dig into some old photos of places that you have been that really have left you in awe of the Creator. And then to either speak that out loud, to journal it, do something that allows you to express what you're feeling in that moment. And I hope you had the chance to do that this week. It was kind of neat in our small group. We were often all, you know, through the week, I would get a picture of somebody out doing something as they were spending time out in creation and contemplating the majesty of the one who created all we see. Well, this week, we're going to allow ourselves to move forward one more step. Again, we're going to work another level up the mountain together in this journey. And we're actually going to return back to the text that we were in last week for much of our time. But remember, we ended at verse 3 with a dot, 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 as, it was, as, it, as if it was to, to be continued to this week. And in reality, it really is to be continued. Psalm 8 is this psalm of David as he is looking out over creation and he's contemplating as well the one who created it. Remember last week we said it's, it's good to look out in creation and to appreciate the majesty of, create, of creation, but it's even better to, impre to appreciate the majesty of the one who created all we see. And that's what David was doing. He was appreciating both the, creator, the creation and the creator. And so here's what David said in expression of that. He says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name 
in all the earth. Remember, it's just as, as if with an artist, you know, David is looking out and saying, you know, artists sign their work. God, it's like you've signed your work. Put your name everywhere. He said, you've set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and avenger. And then I love what David says here. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers. He says again, God, God, I see your fingerprints on everything. Now, I can remember a number of years ago when um, someone had actually stolen the fuel. If you remember, you know, back about 10, 12 years ago when, when gas prices were really high like they kind of are now. Fortunately, they're coming back down a little bit. But when they were really high, there was this kind of problem where people were going and they were stealing the fuel out of vehicles. And so somebody had stolen the fuel out of our church van. And so I'd call the police because we had no fuel to get anywhere, right? So they came and they dusted for fingerprints. And sure enough, you know what they found? Fingerprints all over the little door, the flap that opens up to reveal the entrance to the fuel tank. And they were able to find the criminal who did it eventually. Kind of cool. Now, God is obviously not a criminal. All we're talking about is evidence in this. But David is saying the evidence of your presence, just like your fingerprint might reveal the evidence of your presence, the fact that you had been somewhere, the fact that you had done something, David is saying your fingerprints, God, your unique fingerprints are all over creation. He says they're in the moon and the stars, which God, I know you're the one that set them in place. So David goes on to say this. Here's what happens after the dot, dot, dot. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place. Now listen to his question here. Because David has been contemplating creation in all of its majesty. And as David sees the creation and the creator, it moves him kind of to a next logical place. One that sometimes we avoid going, but one that David boldly goes to as he asks this question, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? What are human beings that you care for them? David says you, you've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All the flocks and the herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. You see what David is doing here? I mean, he's been thinking about the creation. And he's thinking about God the creator. And then he starts to look at himself. And as he sees the majesty of the creator, as he sees the vastness of the universe, all that he could observe with his naked eye, as he sees all these birds and the wild animals and the sky and the sea and everything in it, as he sees what God created, the beauty and the scope, he then turns inwardly, looks inward, and, and starts to contemplate his own existence and says, who, who are we, God, that you would think about us or that you would care about us? And then it moves him to end this psalm the same way that he began it. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You know, last week we used this word to kind of describe the way that David felt. He was in awe, or if you think about the word awesome, it's, it's being at this place where, where you're almost, you're so, you're so struck, thunderstruck by what you see that, that, that you're maybe even a little bit nervous. You're not sure what to do about it, exactly how to respond. You're speechless, and David wasn't quite speechless, but 
but he was struggling sometimes, it seems, for words. God, I don't, I don't even know what to say about the fact that you care about us when I look at creation. So two things left David in awe of God. First, we've already talked about this last week. It was the beauty of creation. And then the size and scope of creation, everything that he was seeing with his eyes left him in awe of God. And that's big. But then maybe even greater, maybe, maybe something that moved David to even, even deeper wonder was this next piece, that the creator of all he saw cared for him. I mean, David asks this question, what is mankind? Who are we, God, that you would care for us? Now, now in our day and age, maybe we don't move to that as quickly as as David would have in his day. After all, we are the self-esteem generation in many ways. We've been taught we're wonderful no matter what. So maybe we don't go there quite as quickly as David does. And in case you don't, Let me just allow you to maybe experience a moment of perspective. How many of you have ever had the opportunity to fly in an airplane? All right, that's most of us, right? How many of you enjoy the window seat? If I'm not at the window, I don't want to fly. I'll just be honest with you. I want to be at the window seat. I will probably fight somebody for a window seat. Or at least give them whatever money I have in my wallet, which normally isn't a whole lot, so I'm probably not winning that one. But if you sat at the window seat, you've probably observed scenes like this. Looking out the window and seeing these fields or this landscape. So there's fields and then there's this river and then there's this civilization beyond it. And when you think about the size of these fields and thinking that each of these are probably several acres in size. Looking out the window, you start to get some perspective. Or how about this one? This one is an airplane flying over New York City. And a city that looks so vast and ridiculously large from the ground looks looks like a miniature, like a plaything from the sky, doesn't it? Or how about this? This is a mountain in Japan. It's beautiful. But at the same time, this is a snow-covered volcano poking out of the clouds And it looks tiny from the air. Or maybe you identify with a scene like this from the coast. I think this was somewhere around Fort Lauderdale. Or maybe a scene in the Midwest where you see a river and then you see what is down here actually a giant barge. But that looks like a Tonka truck, right? I mean, when we see things from the sky like this, it gives us perspective. I tell a story in the book about being uh, in, in high school. It was early in high school, and we had the opportunity to go to, uh, to lower Manhattan. I, I grew, I, in my high school years were spent in New Jersey. We were not all that far from New York City. Now, it took forever to get there, just like sometimes you know how it can take forever to get to Atlanta if there's a lot of traffic, and multiply that by quite a few. So we went to New York City on field trips quite often. I can think of maybe somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen field trips that we took in the years that I lived near New York City. And, and one time, we went to Lower Manhattan, and we had the opportunity to, to, to be right there at the base of what was the, the Twin Towers. So this would have been somewhere probably uh, maybe 1993, 1994, somewhere in that ballpark. And we had the opportunity with my class to go to the top of one of the towers. And at the top was this observation deck that was called the top of the world. I don't know, you may have had the opportunity to go there at some point in time. And I wish I had pictures from that day, but I don't think I probably even owned a camera at that point. But it was amazing to see. And the moment you actually, I can remember walking out, and you know one thing that I remember from that moment is the sound of the wind And the sound of sounds around you, but being that far removed from it, listening to it. It it was a crazy, very surreal moment. And then as you start to look out, you realize we were just down there and now we're up here. And everything down there looks like nothing. I mean, it's peanuts. It's so small. And I remember in that moment, feeling that, feeling small. I mean, really incredibly 
insignificant, knowing that this, I was, I was standing over a city of seven million people, and each one of those people looked like an ant at that point in time. Maybe you've had a moment like that, whether it was being up in the sky or on the top of a mountain or on the top of a tall building, or maybe it was just the awareness of the fact that, that we live right now at a time in which the population of this planet is somewhere around seven and a half billion. Think about that. You're one of seven and a half billion people. I mean, there, there are times where I, I feel small. Or maybe with the scope of things, I feel unimportant or I feel even insignificant. And you know what? Those moments, even though they are uncomfortable, those are actually really good moments. Especially when it causes us to reflect on God the way that David did with a question like this. You see, as, as David looked out over all of creation, he had that moment, that feeling of smallness, that feeling of lack of significance, lack of importance, and then he realizes that God is both mindful of us and cares for us. In spite of our smallness, in spite of the fact that we, again, are one of seven and a half billion. You see, David asked this in a form of a question, but what David is actually doing is asking a question based upon what he already knows. Here's what God knows. We could flip this around and turn this into a statement. God, you are mindful of us human beings. God, you care for us human beings. And I don't quite understand why, but you do, God. You see, I believe that it's in the nature of God, in His nature, it's part of who He is to love created humanity. And I think the reality beyond this is that this also brings us to a second truth, that God cares for us tells us actually more about the nature of God than the worthiness, the worth of humankind. Now, I want you to, to be honest with yourself. Take, just take a moment of quick self-reflection and, and think about your week. Think about all the times you did something that was kind of boneheaded, maybe even unkind, maybe intentionally unkind. Take it beyond the week and think about your life. And think about all the times you've fallen short. Or maybe sometimes that's a kind way to express the times where we've really blown it and messed up. And think about how many of us there are. And then think about the fact that God loves the most sinful among us. As much as He loves the ones that seem to be most righteous. Here's the truth. God cares for us, tells us more about the nature of God than it does the worth of humankind. And when we start to see that God cares about us this way, what becomes plain and evident is this. At least it becomes plain and evident to me. God wants a relationship with me. God wants a relationship with you. Now, you might be looking at that and saying, well, how, how do I know that? How can I say that? That's a pretty bold statement and even pretty, maybe a pretty big leap from where we've just been. God wants a relationship with you. Okay, God cares about us. Okay, I can see how that moves us there. He's mindful of us. Maybe it moves us there, but maybe it's still too much of a leap for you. So let me give you this illustration quickly. Now, I can remember as my, my wife, Lori, and I were starting to get to know each other and we were starting to date, we would often go on walks together. Now, maybe that's something you can identify with. Maybe you're thinking about your spouse and when you first knew, got to know each other, or maybe you even do that now. You go on walks with your spouse frequently. And if you do, you probably know what happens on walks like that. When you walk, you talk. 
When you walk, you get to know each other. When you walk, your friendship deepens, it flourishes. And certainly for us in those first few months, as we would go on these walks, we would talk with each other. We would get to know each other. Our friendship did deepen. Our relationship deepened. And the truth is, it was probably on those walks that I first got to know, I really like this girl. Maybe I even love this girl. Those walks built relationship and expressed the reality of our desire of relationship for relationship with each other. Can I tell you something I think is incredibly, I'm I'm just going to use the word cool. I don't know what else to put on it. It's phenomenal. It's fantastic. It's awesome. God, throughout the pages of scripture, has sought to walk with humankind. I mean, these words are plain and evident through scripture. In Genesis 3, we see this Now, this one may be a tough one and a stretch for some of you, but I just want to give you real quickly how I believe Genesis 3 shows us that that God walked with humankind. As Adam and Eve sin, as they hide from God, and God comes into the garden, how do Adam and Eve know that God is in the garden? They heard his what? His footsteps. They knew that he was there. Somehow they knew what the sound of God's feet, they knew what it sounded like. They knew what it sounded like when God walked in the garden because they had walked with God in the garden. And so as they hear the sound of his footsteps, they run and they hide. But God, who wanted a relationship with Adam and Eve, had walked with them in the garden. And then we see in Genesis 5, and 24, that God walked with Enoch. We see Genesis 6, 9, that he walked with Noah. We see that God walked with Abraham and his son Isaac, Genesis 17, 1 and 48, 15. Then in Leviticus 12, uh, 26, 12, God promises the entire Israelite nation that if they would be faithful to him, he would walk among them. His presence would be with them. And then I want you to think about this, because one of the names for Jesus, who walked among us, is actually Emmanuel, which is God with us, God among us, God right here. And so we saw that as Jesus came and walked on this earth, that it was God being with us, God wanting relationship with us, God wanting to be with his people. And then in Galatians 5, we see Paul speaking these words. He tells us, to walk by the Spirit. Well, maybe that one doesn't point to relationship so much, but how about this one? Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What Paul is saying is, let us develop a habit of walking with God. Relationally. Let us develop this habit where we keep in step with the Spirit because God wants to walk with us. Why? Because of all the things that happen when people walk together, because of the way that relationship grows and builds and develops, when we walk with each other and when we walk with God, the same thing will happen. So I'll say it again, it's in the nature of God to love and desire a relationship with created humanity. Now that's important because of where we're going to be going in the next few weeks, especially as next week, next week we see what what we've done with that relationship, the, the God that wanted relationship with us, how did we treat that God? But I want you just to dwell in this idea this week. The God who created everything, he wants a relationship with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to know you. And he's invited you to walk with him. So it's my prayer that as we move into this week, in fact, we're about to pray, that you will spend time contemplating that. Everywhere you go, think about God wanting to walk with you. What can you do to take a step to walk with God? God makes these incredible incredible promises in a number of different places throughout Scripture that when we seek Him, we will find Him. So will you seek after and walk with God this week? Let's pray. God, as we contemplate the way back and as we take a step further again this week, 
God, I pray that we might be as awestruck as David was by the knowledge that you want to walk with us. By the knowledge that you send us your Holy Spirit, even in these moments, so that we can walk with you. That we can walk in step with you. That we can get to know you. That we can have a true relationship with you. In spite of the times where we might feel small, when we might feel small or insignificant, God, you pursue us because to you, we're not small. We're not insignificant. Every one of us matters. God, you're mindful of us and you care about us. I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us listening whose hearts have been moved this morning. Thank you, God, for caring about us. Together, your people said, amen.